Hi everyone, this is Catherine Ladano, Artistic Director from Numis, and uh, we're having a special little interview session tonight, myself with Peter Hatch, the founder of Numis, and uh, we both uh, prepared about four questions for each other, so we're going to ask each other those questions tonight, get those answers, and um, we thought we would do this in celebration of Numis's 35th anniversary which uh, happens this year in 2020. And uh, as you probably know, we were going to be celebrating that with our May 1st concert. And uh, while that concert will still happen at some point, we decided we, we would do something uh, special instead, uh, virtually to mark the uh, 35th anniversary of Numis. Um, well, I'd moved to Kitchener-Waterloo uh, just the year before from Vancouver. Uh, and before Vancouver, I'd lived in Toronto for a very long time. So I was coming from uh, big cities with healthy new music environments. And I guess when I moved to KW, I was just um, feeling something was missing, that the music that I was really passionate about, that I thought others would love, uh, wasn't really represented. Uh, there was a very strong musical scene for sure, a big classical music tradition, a big choral tradition, a strong indie scene. But when it came to kind of the more experimental stuff that I was interested in, uh, there wasn't a lot going on. So I, I did talk, I talked to colleagues uh, from Laurier and University of Waterloo, Glenn Buer, Boyd McDonald, Michael Purvis Smith, and from UW, David Huron. And we talked about doing things, um, and they actually were, uh, you know, involved in the earliest days. But at some point, I decided just just needed to do something. So I just actually found a, a, a gallery in downtown uh, Kitchener, talked to uh, the uh, president of the gallery, Mary Catherine Newcomb, about doing something, and uh, that's how Numis got started. We just actually, I just put a couple of loudspeakers up and uh, invited people to a concert of electroacoustic music. So no cost, a uh, really great uh, concert and people came. So we did it again um, and then again and again. Well, I mean, a couple of things. I, I do think there's a time uh, when it just feels right. Uh, I, I felt that you know, that Numis was doing well, that I was not like I was running out of ideas, but I was kind of interested in what else someone might do with it, what other directions it could be taken in. Um, but it, also at the same time, I had my uh, door knocked on by the Kitchener Waterloo Symphony to help out with uh, programming uh, for them, with especially with their um, chamber music concert series called Eight Decades, which was a 20th century music uh, series. So I ended up, uh, and that actually later on developed into a full composer in residencies with the orchestra and so on. So back when I was dealing with that, there was simply no time to really do Numis and uh, the orchestra, which was uh, kind of an exciting opportunity for me. So when Anne-Marie Donovan um, expressed interest in taking over, uh, she'd already been involved with Numis. I thought, fantastic, it's in really great hands. Um, and then started the tradition of just being able to go to concerts instead of having to, to work at them, <laughs> which is what happened afterwards. It was great. Well, it was certainly talked about. I mean, the audiences for both Numis and Open Ears are very, very similar. Um, open Ears, as I said, was originally a Kitchener Waterloo Symphony project. So it was already kind of a, a strange collaboration going on uh, from the beginning of a new music, um, uh, sorry, of an orchestra putting on a, a kind of an experimental music festival. Uh, later on, we did collaborate, Open Ears uh, did collaborate with Empty Space and actually with Kafka, the contemporary art form of Kitchener and area. Uh, and it was a really interesting collaboration because it was these three uh, contemporary organizations, one contemporary music, another contemporary theater, and the third contemporary visual art. Um, so that, that was an interesting kind of a collaboration. Um, Numis was core to Open Ears from the beginning. There was always 
the first organization I went to to just um, clear dates and talk about programming uh, so that we could coordinate in a way that would really help out Numis as well as help out Open Years Festival. Um, the idea of doing both, uh, I guess uh, they're, they're different animals. Running a festival is different from running a concert series. Um, and there are certain, there are logistical um, difficulties administratively that I've seen other organizations having to deal with of having deadlines that kind of clash and so on. But as well, uh, to be quite honest, in terms of funding, um, if you have two organizations, you can go to funding bodies with two hands outstretched instead of one maybe bigger hand. So that was, that was part of the thinking as well. But it is, it's certainly an interesting thing to keep exploring. Well, as I said, there were, there were four uh, Laurier faculty members who were involved in early discussions and, and uh, all uh, programmed later on. And uh, <clears throat> then Caroline Weaver came to town and she was involved as well uh, from University of Waterloo. Um, performance faculty, uh, Boyd, of course, was an amazing pianist, is an amazing pianist, so he was involved, but not too much more collaboration with the faculty uh, than unlike, you know, more recent years where it's, that's a very wonderfully tight connection. Um, the first real connection of Laurier uh, uh, performance wise actually came later when the Penderecki Quartet came to town and they were involved, I think they've been involved in every, um, uh, you know, season since then. Um, but as an institution, Laurier became involved in 1989 when Numis did its first festival called the Fifth Stream. And it uh, was hosted by Laurier, housed at Laurier, um, involved people coming from all over the, the country to attend. Um, the Kitchen Owners Symphony was involved, the Laurier people were involved. The whole thing was picked up by CBC Radio, so it was quite a, a, a big deal. A book published out of the proceedings, you can go to my website to find that. Um, and uh, so yeah, so it, there were, I think a big strong uh, connection there, but it just, for me, it just kept getting stronger and stronger. In the earliest days, to be quite honest, I loved the idea of going into downtown, way far away from Waterloo and the universities, going to downtown Kitchener, which was, was quite frankly struggling back then, um, finding a whole different audience amongst the visual artists and other people who lived downtown Kitchener who would come to the earliest uh, concert, numerous concerts. Um, and then of course people uh, would go down from the universities into downtown Kitchener. Very, very different uh, places back then. And um, so I, I loved the kind of the cultural connection it made as well. Yeah, honestly, I feel like it's it's a combination of the two. So, um, I mean, I think as as a lot of people know, improvisation is a big interest of mine. It's a, it's a, a specialty um, in a, in a lot of different ways as as a performer, as a uh, as a teacher, and as an academic as well. And um, I do think that we do a disservice to new music when uh, composition and improvisation are always separate and they're always totally separate things um, because I think that there's they have so much more in common than uh, you know they do with with their differences and I know that uh, a lot of composers uh, use improvisation as a tool for composition I mean, really, improvisation is composition, too. It's just a, a faster form of doing it. Um, and I'm also mindful of the fact that uh, I do think that improvisation is still largely a marginalized art form. You know, there's a lot of people, uh, you know, I know from programming it that there's a lot of people that as soon as they just see the word improvisation, it's like, nope, not going to go to that. And, um, you know, and I've noticed that in, in numerous concerts, when that aspect is kind of hidden to a certain extent. So if the pieces are improvised, but maybe they have titles in the program, um, like this is something that, that my band Stealth does all the time. We have names for our improvisations. And for some reason, the perception changes. 
um, people just seem to get it more. Or they appreciate it more when that, you know, that that uh, line is sort of blurred a bit. So so for me, it's it's a lot of different reasons. And, and I would say, lastly, the other reason is um, I was very influenced by um, by Jesse Stewart uh, when he was artistic director for Numis. And um, well, my experience with Numis wasn't um, like too great before Jesse Stewart. Uh, he did program a lot of improvisation and looking back at the old programs, I kind of feel like he was sort of the start of moving in that direction a bit and uh, going to his concerts and sort of seeing, um, you know, how he balanced like really world-class innovative improvisers um, along with more traditional new music. Like I, th I think he balanced it really, really well um, and definitely have been very influenced by that. And I, I really... Um, I didn't want to let the improvisation go and, and, and I don't intend to in the future either. Yeah, well, I, I think I think there's a lot of benefit to them. And, and I would, uh, before I answer that, I, I would say kind of the, well, I love these initiatives and I love the curator uh, uh, a contest the one thing that kind of breaks my heart every year is is that we get so many incredible concepts and i wish we could do more um you know we we really the reason we do one is we we really only have the funding to do one um and this is kind of an area of our budget that i really want to uh, see expand a lot and my goal at some point is that instead of the emerging curator uh, concert, we would have an emerging curator festival and have, you know, like the top several um, applications and, and uh, because they're always so varied, it's so hard to pick a winner. Um, but I do think just uh, even for those that, that don't end up winning the contest, I do think there's a lot of value in doing it. And um, I actually, in, in one of my courses that I teach at Laurier, I actually require the students to, to do the, um, the contest as an assignment. They don't have to actually enter the contest, but you know, sort of um, do everything that you would have to do if you did enter it. And and my logic in doing that is because um, for these students, you know, if they end up working in contemporary music, if they end up working in this field at all, there's sort of two things that they need to do. They need to know how to do to survive. The one is being able to write a grant application, and the other is to write a project proposal. Um, so, you know, if they, they can have the best idea in the world, but if they can't communicate it, um, you know, if they want to, uh, to apply to Numis or Open Ears or, or whoever, if they can't explain what that concept is and write about it, you know, in a thoughtful and compelling way, good luck, you know, like the, the music is obviously a big part of it, but, but I know for me, when I read those proposals, like it is how you communicate it. You have to sell me on it. And, um, and I think doing this contest, whether you win it or not, uh, allows uh, these, these emerging artists to kind of um, start working on those skills, to write the, the project proposal. Not just that, but they have to do a budget too, which, you know, as you know, is, is, is a huge part of grant writing. Like that's a lot of times that's like 50% of what the jury looks at. So you have to be able to do that as well. And um, Unfortunately, most of the people that apply are still in university or have recently graduated. And unfortunately, these are skills that that most of them don't learn at any point in their career. So I feel like it's it's really important for them to, you know, to get the chance to start doing this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, the the real real answer to that is that just the, the live experience is just so different. Like it's, um, uh, you know, watching something virtually, I just feel like you lose so much. Um, and part of, you know, my thoughts on this kind of come from being an improviser. And, and there's a lot of, of uh, writing that has been done about the relationship between 
the performer and the audience when you're improvising and how, you know, the audience feeds into the performance and they're sort of um, become almost one of the musicians because depending on how they respond and the energy you feel from them, it dictates the direction of the performance. And I think that while that may be more obvious with improvised music, I, I think that applies to every type of uh, performance at all. And, um, you know, I know sometimes being in a, at a live concert, it's just like sometimes it's it's almost like a life altering event, like just the energy in the room at the time. It's it, sometimes you you feel like you've tapped into this really special moment where the, you know, the artists are, are sort of like in perfect flow and everything is clicking and it's just this magical moment. And uh, I've never felt that watching a live performance at home, like never, ever. It just feels... Um, and it almost feels too polished as well. Like a lot of times everything is just so perfect and flawless and like the camera angles are perfect and the lighting is wonderful and, and everything. And it just, it, it's almost like doesn't feel real. Um, and I know um, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of organizations now have to move to, uh, you know, sort of live streaming and virtual performances in, in order to present their programs. And um I know this is something that Numis has talked about because, you know, to be perfectly honest, we don't actually know what's going to happen to next season or, you know, sort of, uh, you know, when we can start presenting live concerts again. We've looked at the idea of doing live streamed events and virtual concerts. And, and I can tell you that almost every single artist I've spoken to hates the idea. Like they don't want to do it. Um, and for good reason. For some of those shows, for a lot of new music shows, um, you would lose so much of it if you weren't there in person. Like there's so, you're so limited. There's so much you can't do. And, um, yeah, I think it's hard to explain that to people that, that maybe don't go to a lot of live events, but it's, um, it's just not the same, um, at all. And, uh, I really hope that we can get back to, to live performances soon. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and, um, I honestly, I could, I could kind of see it going both ways. Um, you know, on the one hand, because so many arts organizations and festivals are, are kind of changing to live streaming and virtual performances, uh, part of me wonders if that will become the norm, if people will not want to go to live concerts because they don't have to. Um, but then the other part of me, I know for, for me, I feel like I'm going to be missing the live performances so much that I'm going to be wanting to go to as many events as I can once self-isolation is over. Um, but again, that's just me. And, you know, as, as you know, it's, it's, it's already hard enough to get people to just come out to new music events. I mean, this is probably... No, is definitely the number one thing that that Numa struggles with, and you know sometimes we'll there'll be so much you know money and energy that goes into an event, and you get a handful of people, and then other events that you assume it will have a very small turnout has a huge turnout, and it's um it's so hard to predict. So um, I'm terrible at predicting these kinds of things, but my hope is that people will, will miss live performance so much that, uh, that they will uh, come out and support the organizations because the, the, the organizations of festivals are going to need that support. So that's, uh, maybe we're inviting people to a virtual concert. <laughs> <laughs> But hopefully we're inviting people to a live physical concert whenever it happens uh, yeah. in the fall or whenever. Um, when it does yeah. happen, it's going to be fantastic. It's a really, really good program. Yeah, so I think there are links all over everywhere, but um, I've, uh, I'm have i marking Numis's 35th anniversary by launching a new website, um, peterhatch.ca. Uh, which you can link to, and Numis, of course, will be, I think there's an archival update going on, um, which hopefully will be around soon as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're all thinking of everybody staying at home, wishing they could be 
uh, at the concert on May 1st. And for sure, me, more than anybody, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm really honored by uh, of celebrating this way and um, looking forward to hearing you play in three of the four pieces and, uh, and the whole evening, whenever it happens. So, hello, Kat. <laughs>